Hello and welcome to today's Tiger webinar. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you and our entire Tiger family are well and weathering this global challenge. We want you to know that the RIT Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all Tigers in the coming weeks with a variety of needs, including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance in the coming months as our workplaces and our work world work through the COVID-19 realities. We especially encourage everyone to connect to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where you will find up-to-date communications and opportunities to connect to other Tiger alumni in your region and your industry. Those links are found in the chat box, and the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. The RIT class of 2020 is finishing their time on campus, but they are just beginning their journey into the lives of purpose for which their RIT education and experiences have prepared them. As a Tiger for Life, we need your help to welcome our graduates to the RIT alumni body, encouraging them as both professionals and people in their next chapters. If you have words of wisdom, advice, or encouragement for this new band of Tigers, please share your thoughts with them at rit.edu slash alumni slash tiger dash wisdom. We, all want to, uh, we also want to ask you to join us on May 8th as we celebrate our class of 2020 virtually. We will be streaming a virtual celebration on May 8th at 5 p.m at rit.edu slash class of 2020. As you're aware, our soon to be fellow alumni won't be able to celebrate the way many of us did with a week of formal commencement ceremonies. So let's make this virtual event special until they can come back together for something that is more official. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university during this unprecedented situation. And we are incredibly grateful for those offers. If you are able to help, we encourage you to support the COVID-19 emergency fund, which is still helping students with unplanned needs, including emergency housing, technology to complete online studies, transportation, and healthcare. We have included a link uh, to information regarding that fund and a way to support it in our chat box. Tiger Support has brought us nearly to the goal for that fund, and we thank all who have made a gift. We want to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with our presentation tools. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the webinar transmission. The webinar platform is secure and does not require VPN access. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions for our panel can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You are joining this event using broadcast audio. If you wish to dial in by phone, dial in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning is also being provided and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. Today's discussion will be recorded and made, and made available, complete with captions in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to our discussion. We are happy to welcome Tiger men's hockey coach, Wayne Wilson, and two former RIT Tigers, Chris Tanev and Jared DeMichael. With 21 seasons at RIT under his belt, under his belt, not under your boat, under his belt, Coach Wilson has guided the university to become one of the most successful and respected programs in all of college hockey. Wilson's impressive record with the Tigers includes leading the team through the transition to the respected Atlantic Hockey League. In 12 seasons in that league, RIT has won four regular season titles, three postseason championships, and made three NCAA tournament appearances. Coach Wilson became the first coach to win the National Coach of the Year at both the Division I and Division III levels in 2010. Chris Tanev, now a defensive man, a defenseman and alternate captain for the Vancouver Canucks. In the 2009-2010 season with RIT, he helped the Tigers advance to the NCAA Frozen Four and was a standout himself, earning Atlantic, Atlantic Hockey's Rookie of the Year award. 
Jared DeMichael is a former Tiger goaltender who won three Atlantic Hockey Association regular season titles and one postseason AHA championship in his four-year career. Along with Tanev, he helped lead RAT to the 2010 Frozen Four and holds the Tigers Division I record for career victories and wins in a season by a goaltender. In 2010, DeMichael was named Goaltender of the Year. Moderating tonight's discussion is WITR men's hockey announcers, Scott Bigger and Ed Trevsger, who will take your questions during the webinar. Thank you all for joining us and our audience is all yours. Well, thanks, Lydia. And this is pretty exciting for both Scott and I to do this because we were observers and broadcasters during that season 10 years ago. And it's nice to take a look back and it's hard to believe it's been it's been 10 years. But guys, we kind of like to go back through that season and, and how it culminated in that trip to the Frozen Four. It was so unlikely at the time. You know, there had been some interesting things along the way. We'd seen Holy Cross upset Minnesota a couple of years before that in the NCAAs. But RIT was a team that had just gone from Division Three to Division One. It won the league regular season championship in Jared's freshman year before RIT could even participate in the postseason. And as we look back on that 2009-2010 uh, season, it wasn't until about the middle of the season that it looked like this Tiger team really had any momentum, starting out 0-5 and, and, and really working its way back to 500 right around the middle of the season. So I'll, I'll just throw that out as a place to start. Uh, starting out 0-5 and, and kind of working its way back, did you guys feel like you had a team that could win the league or, or was were you still trying to feel things out early on in the season? Maybe we'll start with Jared on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think our, our start to the season, obviously wins and losses wasn't where we wanted to, to be. Um, but I thought we had really good leadership in our locker room, um, starting with Dan Ringwald. I think after those first few losses, I remember we had a players only meeting and um, Dan was basically just like, hey, like we know we have a good team. Like we need to stop with the one goal losses. We need to find a way to put a team away and, um, we had some tough out-of-conference losses where uh, games could have gone either way. I should have stopped a few more pucks, things of that nature. Um, but I think we knew we had a good group. Um, I think we knew we had whatever some really good freshmen like Tanny that um, we just needed to kind of figure out some roles and things like that. But I think we, went, we ended up going on two pretty large winning streaks, and I think that gave us a lot of confidence throughout the season. Yeah, and, and Jared, you mentioned those two streaks. After the 0-5 start, you went 9-0-1 for the remainder of that first half of the season. And then, you know, heading into the playoffs, you swept the last three regular season series with Army, Air Force, and, and Canisius. And that gave you a lot of momentum, um, you know, towards the end of the season. And Chris, as, as a freshman, what was it like to, you know, kind of ride those peaks and valleys as the season went on? Yeah, I mean, I, I had no idea what I was getting into a uh, Freshman, you're, I was playing with Ringer, um, obviously a great player, great captain, as, as D. Mike's already said, and um, I, I sort of got thrown into the fire, and you, you play, and I, and I got, I believe I got scored against my first shift in college, in, in, in against Colgate in the um, in the big rink downtown, and I was after that, it was like, oh man, like is this is this <laughs> a lot different than than year two junior in in Ontario, and um, and and like D Mike said, the first few games were all one goal losses or or, or tight games where where we felt like we played well, and and we just um, I mean, just couldn't pull pull a win out at the end or, or got a bad bounce here or there and, and those things happen but I think as as you said we had a we had a good group of guys um great group of senior leaderships and and I think the coaches believed in us and that was that was a huge part of our success later on in the season we've talked a little bit already about Dan Ringwald and Chris being paired with him and him, him also a captain on that team what kind of things did you learn from Ringer during that time in your freshman year um, I, I think you just you you see how calm he is all the time, um, how smart he plays. I mean, he he really thought his way around the arena. He he made little little play little bumps, little passes that 
like the average fan wouldn't even notice, I think, um, how smart he was. His stick was great. I mean, knocking down pucks, just forcing guys where, where he wanted them to go. So, I mean, he does a lot of things that I think, um, the, as I said, the average fan or, or even a fan that watches all the time might not even notice how smart he was and, and how good he, he, he was. He controlled, he controlled a lot of the game when he was on the ice. Hey, Coach, there's some teams over the years when when the the staff really has to get involved in uh, you know in, in instruction and playmaking and and those kinds of things. And there's other years where you, you kind of take a more hands off and you know let the seniors and the players um, run things. What was that year like for you? I think that what you said was was pretty accurate. Uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to reflect uh, because as a coach or even as a player, you're going through it game by game. So. You lose a tough game, you move right on to the next one. I, I did find it interesting because I printed out the schedule from that year and, and all that, and you forget that your first five games is half of your losses for the year, and uh, and you move on. But I think as a coach, you, you try and give guidance, um, and then there just comes a time during the year that you're about to go in and talk to the guys, and once they start having their own conversations in between period, that, uh, that you can kind of just – hand the keys over to them and, and let them go. And as both those guys said, I thought we had great leadership that year and we still believed in the team and, and looking back at the losses with the exception of uh, obviously Wisconsin at the end, but two Minnesota state games, the losses were all by one goal. So we, we knew we were right there. So even those games were very winnable, but you know, in, in hockey, I think uh, the parody is so strong that uh, you've got to find ways to win those close games, the one goal games and, and uh, as much as you can talk as a coach, it, it's much better when it comes from your seniors and your captains once they start talking. Because I think Tanny is going to listen more to what Ringer has to say than what the coach says. I think it's more meaningful when it comes from your upperclassmen when they're giving guidance and, and, and talking. And uh, like I said, we, we had good leadership and, and good competition within. And, and I think the guys believed in themselves It just – it's getting over that hump when you're going through those tough streaks that it's got to come within the locker room. After that uh, Minnesota State weekend, until the Frozen Four, the team only lost three games from then on out. What was the difference in the team? What started to gel or was it attitude? What came together to, to really make that team special the rest of the way? Uh, either one of you guys or both. I, th I mean – I think it's more of a, a modern day term, but I think we definitely picked up a lot of swagger. Um, I think the it was kind of ironic. Our team motto that year was the streak, and we went on a large winning streak before losing to Mankato. But I feel like we really just did a good job of flushing those two losses to Mankato um, and then just hopping right on back onto the saddle and doing things from there the second half of the season. Um, but I think uh, – a lot of it too. I mean, I think a lot of it stems from Coach Wilson. Like we just hated losing. Like hated losing. I think we might have hated losing more than we liked winning, and we just wanted to find ways to win games. And we bring up guys um, buying into roles and things like that. But I think we had a lot of confidence, and I think we had a lot of buy-in from guys being comfortable in the situations that they were put into, and they knew that they had confidence and we knew whatever everybody had each other's backs, not just on the ice, off the ice too, we had a, whatever. We still have a very special group off the ice as well too. So you kind of rolled through the, the playoffs, the Atlantic hockey uh, championship games at Blue Cross Arena. You dominated Canisius 4-0, um, eliminating the Griffins to only 20 shots on goal in the semifinal game and then Sacred Heart 6-1 to in the championship game. And you kind of controlled that pretty much from the opening faceoff. Then the, the next day you got to sit down and, watch the ESPN selection show and learn your fate in the, the NCAAs. What was it like just being a part of that and, and seeing RIT up on the big screen and being talked about from ESPN's perspective, either one of the players? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was, it was incredible. I mean, I was a freshman and coming from, um, I mean, I, I wasn't playing hockey like two, three years, three years before that really. And I was just being able to be in that situation was incredible. And, I mean, you don't really think of it as, I mean, I don't even really, really remember it that much. I think I was living in the moment so much and, and so excited for the, um, for the opportunity. And 
I think, as you said, we just we started rolling, and after that Mankato series, that I remember, Wills, he never he never really gets mad, and after that series, he I think we were winning a little bit before that, and and we we got smoked in there, we went in there and got killed, and and Wills got a little mad and was like, if you guys want to be in the tournament and and win, like this team isn't even that good. You guys want to go in and play against some really good teams we're going to get waxed so i think that that gave everyone a little bit of a wake-up call and then we we sort of rolled from there and then as you said in, in playoffs it was um everyone just came together and i think when when you have a special group like we had where i think everyone is um so tight and and we had such a great team chemistry that once we won once one game in playoffs i felt like we we just started to roll the uh, I want I wanted to say something too about that selection show. I don't know if Tanny or Wills remember this, but um, I think there were some cameras there just watching the team in our lounge, and we get to watching it pops up Denver RIT, and I'll never forget Scott Knowles stands up and like gives it like a fist pump, his <laughs> high fiving guys, and we're all like trying to act like it's cool, and then the cameras go away, and we're just like we got to play freaking Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, and I'd like to comment too because I got a little bit different perspective. Is because we've had we had some pretty good teams before this particular team won the regular season title, and um, you know I was more relieved after winning the the playoff championship because to us that was the only thing that really mattered, or at least to the coaching staff. We used to emphasize winning the regular season title and all that, and you still want to win regular season titles, and and then Tani kind of probably can relate to it at the pro level, you know, you want to make the playoffs, but winning the Stanley cup is everything. Well, for us, you know, we had won the regular season title, I think two years before that two other times, but lost in those single game eliminations at, at, uh, at blue cross and never made it. And the team that got all the accolades was, and it was air force, I think both years, if I'm, if I'm correct, but mm-hmm. they got all the accolades. Like they were the top team. It's like, well, well we're the top team, but you know, we, we lost the game, but it's the wrong game. And, and for me, winning the regular season title was nice. You know, I was appreciative of it. But the only thing I cared about was winning the playoffs because I wanted to get to the NCAAs. And, and so winning that 4 nothing game was a, a sense of relief and a confidence builder, even for the coaches to go into that final game going, you know, now it's right in front of us. We've got to win this to, to move on. And, and that uh, was important, uh, I, I know, to the coaching staff. So, you know, a great season, but the playoffs is all that I was consumed with. And uh, because that's what it is playing. You want to get to the NCAAs. You want to win a national championship. And it's like that in a lot of sports. But uh, the regular season was deemed irrelevant to me at that point after two previous years and uh, of winning the regular season. So we've, we've placed all our emphasis now on, on playoffs and getting ready for playoffs and not the regular – Get yourself in a good position in the regular season, but let's let's play the playoffs. Before we go on to the NCAAs, one thing that was really remarkable about that team was how much scoring and how much goal scoring, not just uh, getting a lot of uh, assists, how much goal scoring came out of that crew of defensemen. Uh, maybe people don't think it's that remarkable now when defensemen are a lot more involved, but uh, – at the time, that really stuck out. So maybe Chris and, and maybe a follow up from Wayne. Uh, how uh, how remarkable it was to have that uh, blue a uh, group of blue liners you had that year, and how much you were able to contribute on the scoreboard. Yeah, I mean, I think we had a we had a great group of D. I mean, we had we had some good players that that e- weren't even playing, and and we had a few injuries that, and we had some guys who, who came in and stepped in and, and were able to, to do a good job for us. I mean, for me, I was just, I was just going out and playing. I was, I was having so much fun and um, every game was, a, was a great opportunity. And it was, um, as I said, I just enjoyed uh, playing and, and me and Ringer had a, had great chemistry. I felt like, and for the most part, if we could, we could control a lot of the games if, if we were playing well, um, and as I said, it was great to have those guys. I mean, I think Eki tore his ACL that year, and and Mazer had a high ankle sprain, I believe. But I, I, you could correct me if I'm wrong. So I mean, we had we had guys come in and, and step up, and, and that played huge roles on on the defensive end. And uh, you know, it's it's funny. I, I again, I brought out the, the sheets to reflect here a little bit. 
We had three defensemen, Tanny being one of them, with uh, all over 10 goals. Four defensemen over 20 points in college hockey. That's quite a bit. And as he alluded to, we didn't realize, but we only had six defensemen. Uh, Riley Clark, who had left the team um, just for academic reasons, uh, uh, because of uh, wanting to become a doctor. So he was in the pre-med program. And, and then Eki did tear up his knee. So we were down to, uh, here's our, our six, and they all played. And they were all obviously very important. And uh, uh, But we were also lucky as you go down a second half of the year and and not to have the injuries that happen in, in hockey. And uh, otherwise, we would have been playing shorthanded all the way through. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it was a remarkable group of defensemen. And the way we play the game now, even versus then, I don't think we put too many shackles on the guys, but uh, we didn't encourage them to get up the ice as much as we do now with their defensemen and activating them and that. And uh, they put up uh, incredible numbers as a, as a group, uh, really good numbers. Starting to look at that pair of NCAA games in Albany, Chris, you scored five minutes or so into that first period of the Denver game, and and that goal held up until late in the third period. How important was that goal to kind of you know give the team the confidence to roll the rest of that game? Yeah, well, I mean, thank God for D Mike. That game, he was uh, <laughs> he was incredible. But I mean, it was um, yeah, I. I be- I, I believe I remember the goal. I think the D tried to rim the puck, and I, I just jumped past the guy and, and got in a good opportunity and, and had a good shot and ended up scoring. But, I mean, uh, I felt like we came in thinking we could beat them. Obviously, we were a little nervous. I think when you're when you're that much of an underdog as, as people had us, you're, you, you don't know what to expect. You don't know right away if the team's going to jump all over you and, and you're going to be fighting to survive the whole game. But I think we... We came out pretty good and, and getting that I mean getting that goal when you're when you are an underdog, that first goal is huge because you, you get a little bit of belief and then I mean we sort of wrote D Mike's coattails, especially late in the third there, but he he played a great game for us and I mean at, at that time of the year all you, I mean, as Will said, it's a single game elim- elimination. So I mean all you care about is the win. It doesn't really matter how you do it. One of the uh, folks watching, one of the fans watching asked what the mentality was in the locker room going into the Denver game. Yeah, I mean, D Mike's can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, but I think we were after winning the division, we had a lot of confidence in ourselves, and and we were rolling. I mean, he like he said earlier, we had we had some swagger, and we were we felt good about ourselves. I think it was it was a obviously being being an underdog like that can help you a lot sometimes, right? I mean, they, they probably took it, took us uh, a little lightly and we came out strong. Yeah. I mean, I definitely say like, I felt like um, we were, we were definitely confident. Like we were, we were just looking at that Denver game where I wasn't thinking much more than that. But I also think a lot of us had a chip on our shoulder that we wanted to prove something for ourselves, for our teammates, for our IT, like, uh, I think going into it, a lot of people maybe underestimated us or disrespected us. And I think as a group, like we were hungry to kind of show these people what we could do and whatever. Tanny started it off there with a nice stick shot, shot about halfway up as Brian Hills would say to get the boys rolling. And we, we played, I thought we played a pretty good game from there. You know, we kept things from the outside and uh, the crowd was there, which made it awesome too, which definitely gave us a lot of uh, extra juice like the, like the corner crew does. Yeah, the uh, the RT cert, RT fans certainly showed up. Uh, the corner crew had that the whole corner filled there in Albany, both games uh, against Denver and UN, UNH, and they were screaming their heads off the whole time. How, how important is that kind of support when you guys are out on the ice? No, it, I would say it's huge. Like um, that was one thing coming RIT never expected, but RIT travels really well on the road. Like I remember when we played uh, at UConn. Like we would outdraw the Yukon fans and um, we'd go to AIC and Bentley and there'd be more orange in the crowd than there would be their colors. Um, but it definitely, it, it was cool stepping on the ice there in Albany and just seeing a sea and orange. And um, it felt like RAT took over that arena. The, the more we started to play our style of tiger hockey um, it's fun. I mean, obviously RAT is a super, super special place and that corner crew second to none in, in college hockey. So we go back to the end of that uh, Denver game, and uh, Denver gets a late power play goal, a little over five minutes left. And uh, 
about a minute 45 uh, left in the game, Denver pulls its goaltender. And it's um, defensive zone after defensive zone faceoff. And you've got uh, freshman Adam Hartley in there taking all of those like, throughout the rest of the game. And, and you know, and and Jared, you're, you're there in net watching all this. And everybody's in the stands, the broadcasters, our hearts are pounding. What was, what, what was that last minute forty five, which probably uh, seemed to take a half an hour? Uh, how, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I whatever. Try not to be a dead horse, but just having a lot of confidence in our team. Like Adam Hartley, we call him Hearts. Hearts is unreal at faceoffs, um, and I'll never forget too that year. Um, I think I think Hearts might have started the year on the wing. And we switched him to center maybe after a few games. I remember David Salako like hopping on the ice and he's at least the beast. The beast is in the middle now. And, and Hartley played center for the rest of the year, but um, he's a big body. He's strong on draws. Like I remember him doing a really, really good job. And um, I think something, whatever, and being a coach now that you didn't realize it at the time, but Hartz might have been a freshman, but he was 21, 22 years old as a freshman. <clears throat> and he was one of the few guys that was younger on the team, but. Um, Hearts has been through a lot of those situations. A lot of us have, so we had a ton of confidence and we also had to hold on to a lot of one goal leads. So um, I don't think you really get caught up in situations and stuff like that. We just looked at it as, Hey, this is a game. We got to find a way to win it. And we weathered the storm and the, the, the guys did an awesome job. Coach, usually in that situation, the, the, you know, you're putting your seniors out, your upperclassmen out that have kind of, you know, been in those key positions before. And, you know, what was going through your mind putting a freshman into that spot? Yeah, I, I was a little nervous with that, to be <laughs> honest with you. Uh, but, you know, the, the face-offs were all on the right side, uh, right side of D-Mikes. And uh, he was winning all of them there. And we just decided to go, with, it's more important, let's get the win here. And, and he was solid defensively, but... Uh, we had Favitt and Burt, who were, you know, all league players at that time. And uh, and we might, I can't remember who the wingers were at the time, but we were rotating wingers and so on. And, uh, but we just wanted to win the draws. But it, really, I, I felt, I mean, the whole game felt really good about the team up until, like you said, about the last five minutes is when it got interesting. But there was still a calming effect that D. Mikes was stopping the puck and seeing it. And, uh, um, even though they never really got good chances. I was upset. I just remember with uh, uh, George Gwizdecki, the, the Denver coach, you know, uh, asking to check the time, which he really used as another timeout in his favor because the refs went over to make sure no time went off the clock and things like that. And something I kind of learned and used later on is, <laughs> is if you don't have any timeouts, left, go tell the ref they, they ran another two seconds off and the refs got to go over there. And it gives you a bit of a break, but uh, – um, yeah, I just, uh, they didn't have great chances. We really, uh, you know, packed it in around the net, uh, and they didn't get great looks, but they had a couple of good shots and we had to come up with some saves, but Hart, I think won all his draws and, uh, we were just going off of how he was doing after the second period. And that was his side. So I think it was on the left side. We probably would have used one of the other two guys, but that was Hart's to, to, to do it. And I'm sure the upper class were going to just put me out there, but. A great job on his part. Well, why don't we uh, move on to that uh, New Hampshire game? Um, you know, it, it, it almost it almost felt to us uh, as we were broadcasting. It's like, wow, you know, this is a great accomplishment to win the game. But what is it going to be like against New Hampshire? We had seen them beat Cornell the night before. That was a maybe a mild upset in that one. And then we go on to the New Hampshire game. And you got to first, and then you score a whole ton and open up a 4-1 and then a 5-1 to one lead. Um, at what point in that game, at what point in that game did you feel like you were going to win that game? Was it right from the beginning, or is it as things started to un unravel for UNH and go the right way for you guys? Take the one, Tanny. Yeah, I mean, for me, I I thought we dominated the game, the whole game, right for, right from the start of the puck. So I mean, I, I think obviously, like D Mike said, people even before the tournament started, people counted us out. So after we beat Denver, 
I think people thought, oh, they got lucky. They're they're going to lose to UNH now, and I and, and we completely felt the opposite. And I, I think we were very confident. And and, and I, if I remember, I mean, I, I thought we dominated that game from right from the start, and and we brought it to them. And I and I think we we outskated them, and and we forechecked the the crap out of them. And and I don't think they expected that to happen. Uh, I thought. I thought that game, the coaches did a really good job preparing us. Like we didn't have a ton of time for video, but I think they made a point that we wanted to be physical. We wanted to be aggressive. We wanted to basically have like a, a punch first mentality. But I would say maybe with like five minutes in the third, when we had, I think it was six to one at that time, like we had a pretty healthy lead. Like I think we, we knew we were in a good spot, but um, for me, the second period was awesome. I'm down with the corner crew and, I think we scored three or four goals that that period, and it was just like Park Az Fest and Jazz Fest in Rochester, <laughs> all celebrating, and I'm celebrating with them. And <laughs> I'm like, is this really going on? Um, but I, I've told this story a few times. But I remember in the third period, uh, Chris Ciarasino lines up for the draw, and he's just like looking back at me, smiling, and we're just like, "We're going to Detroit. We're going to the <laughs> Park. Can you believe this?" And, and like, I'm like, "Ceo, get back! Like, get back for the faceoff. Pay attention." Like, uh, that's Ceo. Yeah, if, if we have a one-goal lead, I don't think we're acting like that. Um, but I think we were just so excited and, um, like, whatever. It, it was a, a super special group, like I said earlier, super special still to this day. But definitely having that lead made us enjoy it a little bit. I think we we're also far enough away from Wilt that he couldn't strangle us for celebrating <laughs> like that. So. Yeah, I, I thought when we left the rink really after the Denver, I think that's – our confidence was a mile higher – our energy level. I mean, we were excited to play the next game. We weren't nervous and we were going to attack it. And, and, uh, we never really, I mean, we watched UNH, but we didn't write any notes down until we weren't going to waste our time. We just want to get through Denver and, and then attack them. But we, we want to focus on what we wanted to do and we want to dictate the game the way we want to play. I didn't want to worry ourselves about what they're doing and how we're going to stop them and all that. We want to have them worry about us, but we were, mentally and physically in a real good place going into the game and and uh, knowing that we were only one game away but i think uh yeah we were excited for that opportunity yeah and, and it seemed like unh was on their heels from the first period and especially after that three goal outburst in the middle of the second where you scored uh, those goals in a minute 34 from that point on you know you could see the unh players they were just in shock and they really didn't know uh, you know, what to do or what to expect from there. And, and you kind of controlled the game the rest of the way. So that was the, you know, your your strategy worked and the players executed it. It worked well. <clears throat> so so then you, you get on the bus and it must have been a pretty exciting bus ride home. You, you go to get off the throughway and all of a sudden campus safety is there and then it kind, kind of gets crazy as they escort you back onto campus. What was that like as you were pulling up into the, by the student union? No, we definitely, uh, I think we felt like rock stars at that point where we had a police escort and Stu Hughes had the Zamboni out there and uh, there was hundreds of people. I mean, it was it was Scott Knowles' birthday weekend. I remember getting off there and Scott Knowles is, is crowd surfing and um, the president, the president was there, President Hitler. I mean, I don't know what time it was. I mean, it had to have been whatever, one or so in the morning or something like that. It was late, but. Definitely was really, really cool. There was whatever cameras there and things like that. Um, I still like to to chirp my wife about this because when we went to Albany, she only brought a change of clothes for one day. So I remember getting off there and seeing her and being like, I think you should have packed some more clothes for some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was a, that was incredible coming in. I think when we got the police escort in, everyone was everyone was fired up because no, I don't think anyone at that point had 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 that had had that happen before and i mean it was incredible the support all the um all the fans showed um outside the arena and that it was <laughs> definitely something i'll never forget and as d mike said i'll, I'll never forget nolsey getting crowd surfing and fans tossing him up in the air i mean he's he was uh he's a small man but he was pretty strong then. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty funny so you get back to campus, it's uh, <clears throat> get ready for the Frozen Four. Unfortunately, you had that week in between because that would have been a quick turnaround. But you had to get ready 
uh, to go to uh, face Wisconsin and head to Detroit, face a uh, media situation that was different for you. What kind of things did you do during that week to get ready, uh, not just on the ice, but in general, just to prepare for the situation? Um, I, To be honest, I, I can't recall too much that we did differently, but I mean, I, I wish we played the next day after we played UNH because I think we would have beat them then. But um, that that two week period was uh, was was tough. I mean, I, th I think it was it's sort of emotionally draining when you have to wait that long to play again after after what we just did. Yeah, I, I I'd say things were were normal except for the media and just like the outside noise. Like that definitely. Um, I think the outside noise and the fact that we were on a good roll where we, we had been playing for most of the weekends and things like that. So um, it was definitely, I think, maybe a little different too on campus where there was obviously a lot of excitement. There's even more, I think, even heightened excitement for the, mm -hmm. the Frozen War, but just the um, that the outside noise definitely, I think, maybe um, affected us a little bit. But at the end of the day, I think if we just would have kept playing, it definitely would have helped us. Um, but the two-week layoff definitely affected us not the, not the best way at the end of the day. Yeah, it, it's interesting, really. Uh, you know, I, I guess it is a fine line. You want to score first, and obviously against Wisconsin, we didn't, and, and the other games we did. But uh, uh, as they said, the two weeks is one thing. Um, I think, and I may be wrong on this, I think Denver finished ahead of Wisconsin <laughs> uh, or beat them in maybe in the playoffs. I can't remember how it was. So, you know, we knew it was going to be a similar team to Denver and, and or maybe <clears> – <throat> just a hair behind uh, Denver and they had time to then re really kind of respect our IT. You know, they, they were able to digest what we, we just did. You know, like by us beating Denver, I think we commanded their respect and then, and then beating UNH pretty well. So they were ready. And, and, you know, they had the Hobie Baker winner and Jeffrey on and they step in. And then you look at their defensemen as good as our defensemen where I think they had just as many with over, 10 goals. I think they had the, the leading scoring defenseman, the most goals uh, of a collective group. And that was a pretty good group. But, um, you know, going into it, I, they had time to really uh, emphasize RIT. And, and uh, you know, maybe we were coming down a little bit from the high. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to say. But, uh, um, you know, we ran into a, a real tough Wisconsin team. And, and I think the fact that we didn't score first, uh, was a major factor. And then uh, the penalties. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget yeah. Kornacki getting thrown out of the game. The major. Who was the most gentleman player in our league. I think he got two minutes all year. And, and uh, actually, I have it here. And then he gets kicked out of that game. I, I, I couldn't believe it here. Uh, that even happened. But anyways, it did uh, happen to him. But um, that's the way it goes. And uh, uh, But uh, the experience was unbelievable leading up to it. And uh, and it wasn't ideal. Ford Field ice conditions were awful for all teams, um, but I, I think on hindsight it was probably a good thing because I don't think our fans bought uh, Frozen Four tickets in advance, and this allowed them to get in the building now. When most buildings, if you didn't buy your tickets, you weren't getting in, and uh, uh, it allowed for a lot of our fans to make it to the game, and and it was great. Yeah, and they definitely left an impression. Um, you know, that whole corner filled with uh, with orange. You know, to this day, we, you know, as Ed and I travel around the country to Frozen Fours and other things, people always come up to us when they see we're affiliated with RIT and, and say, you know, your fans were so good in Detroit. And, you know, it really got RIT a lot of um, a lot of publicity as they were start trying to grow from a, a regional college into a, a national college. And, uh, you know, from a, a player's or a coach's perspective, a lot of that was from how you guys represented uh, the university uh, during that weekend. So, you know, any, any thoughts on, on that? No, I, I think um, I do remember our fans still chanting for us after we lost to uh, Wisconsin there. And then in the national championship game, I think most of the, the corner crew still stuck it out and was still chanting RIT and still chanting Civ for the goalies, giving up goals and things like that. So um, I remember whatever some of us, we did get together and watch the, some of the national championship game and remembered that, but um, it definitely whatever it, it whatever it, it was cool even after the season, um, just whatever the notoriety and obviously 
um, Tanny getting the, the exposure there and the ability for him to sign an NHL contract. That was, that was really, really cool. Um, so it was definitely a, a once in a lifetime experience and super lucky to play for RIT. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, your careers after that frozen four season. We'll start with Chris. He signed uh, the deal with Vancouver in the summer, uh, spent quite a bit of the season in what was then the uh, AHL at Manitoba. And then one year after being in the Frozen Four, you're playing in the Stanley Cup Finals for the Canucks. Can you take us through that signing in that year and, and how that all came together? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a crazy year. I'm sort of um, signed in, in Van and, and I shipped out there to, to go work out. I, I lived in Vancouver all that summer and, and worked out with their strength guys and, and skated with their... Um, the player development guys all summer it was sort of just be me, me by myself and I, I didn't really know anyone in the city and it was definitely a weird summer and, and a, sort of a weird transition from from going with a such a tight-knit group of guys to uh, sort of being by myself all summer and um yeah I, we had rookie camp and i had a really good rookie camp um scored scored a few goals but had a couple assists but I, but i played really well and um Started the year in Manitoba. Um, first few games in Manitoba, I, I didn't, I didn't play well at all. I, I didn't think, in in my mind, and it's sort of maybe first five, six games. This team was struggling. I struggled a little bit. Um, coach was Claude Noel, um, really, really good coach, really good man, and he he sort of pulled especially all the younger guys into the room. And I mean, at the AHL is is teams are trying to develop players but but Manitoba is a different situation because they're not owned by Vancouver so they they sign their own players and and they expect the team to win much like a um, Hershey or a, a Chicago in the AHL so as much as they want to develop players they 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 want to win and they had had a good fan base so i mean it's um we we started out the same way almost as as we did in RIT i think it was Oh, and I don't know, or four, oh, and five on, on a road trip to start the year. And um, so af after that, I, I, I got better. And I, um, I mean, I always, always try to work as hard as I can and, and do all that stuff. Right. And I think I got called up um, early January, mid January. And um, I ended up, ended up staying the rest of the year um, up that, I mean, I, I got scratched a, a couple times, but I was, I was with the big club the rest of the year from, from January. And um, I think I played my first game in Colorado. Was, uh, I didn't think I was going to play. I, I sort of got called up as this, to be the seventh D man for two weeks. They had an injury and they were like, you've been playing well and, and you can go up and it sort of enjoy, this is just being a, having a perk of, of playing well and, here's two weeks and just enjoy the sort of the NHL lifestyle. And I don't think they expected to play me and I didn't, I didn't expect to play either. And then my first, first game watching was in Minnesota and Andrew Alberts hurt his shoulder. So, so I ended up playing two days later in Colorado and um, pretty much played the rest of the year up. And then, and then I ended up getting sent down to at the start of playoffs back to Manitoba to play playoffs. So, I mean, back to manitoba and i think we played um lake erie which is cleveland and then hamilton and then we lost but vancouver it'd be in chicago and nashville and ended up getting called back up and i played against san jose at the end of that series and then obviously going into the finals it was, i was almost like it was just over a year past uh, rit which was which was crazy and uh playing in that series obviously it it sucks to lose i mean that's uh for all the marbles right there and um still i i actually just watched that game seven of that series was on about two weeks ago or 10 days ago and it, it's the first time i watched that game since we lost i i really had no recollection of what even happened in the game and that was the first time i watched it and um yeah i mean it was a it was a year that had a lot of ups and downs but it, it was uh it was awesome after chris after coming from rit with uh, the corner crew and everything you know, as we watched your career develop with Vancouver, it, it seems like you've really been embraced by the fans there and by the media there. They're always very, uh, you know, complimentary on your playing style, your ability to get the puck out of your own zone, that smart first pass and everything like that. What's it like having that support at the NHL level? 
Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's always it's always good when when the fans have your back, or and I mean, media for the most part, I think it, it likes me. I mean, you never know with media. One day they can like you, one day they cannot. So I mean, it can change real quick. But I mean, yeah, they've been they've been awesome to me throughout my throughout my years here. So I mean, it's uh, it's been an incredible experience so far. One more for Chris before we get to uh, Jared's career. Now as a, a veteran you're in a position where you get to be the mentor to a lot of young guys. How have you embraced that role? Yeah. I mean, now, I mean, it's crazy how, when I first started playing, I don't think we, I was the only guy under 25 maybe. And I, when I first started playing and now, now I'm 30 and I'm, I think I'm like fifth or sixth oldest on the team now. So, I mean, I think 30 used to be the average age and now it's sort of uh now everyone's like 25 and 26 and younger, but I mean, it's, it's awesome. I mean, when I, when I was young, we had some guys who, who sort of took me in and, and showed me the way. And, um, and I, I, you try to pay that forward, um, as you get older. So, I mean, now we have my D partners, Quinn Hughes, he's anyone who watches college hockey probably knows how, how skilled he was coming out of Michigan and, the stuff he can do on the ice is, is absolutely incredible. So, I mean, it's, it, it was a, a fun time playing with him and then sort of showing him the ins and outs of, of what's happening in the NHL. Jared, you've made your, your post RIT path through the coaching ranks. Um, you've had a lot of success with the RIT women's program. You went through a Nazareth men's program and helped them start out. Um, now you're at Massachusetts under coach Greg Carval. How, was coaching something you thought about when you were playing at RIT, or is that something that developed after graduation? Yeah, I, I would say developed after graduation. Um, my first year of, of pro, I definitely missed uh, how we ran things day to day at RIT, um, the communication from the coaches, the, the video that they did, the one on one work, and just that camaraderie that you kind of had. And then going into my second year of pro, I think I knew uh, I might be more of a suitcase and a hockey player. And I remember when I was bouncing around, I talked to <clears throat> Wills and I was just like, Hey, Wills, like, I'm thinking I might want to get into coaching. Like if you think I'd be brutal, just tell me, Hey, you'd be brutal and look into something else. And, um, Wills was great where he, he set me up with George roll and had a prior relationship with George roll from NAS where he recruited me when he was working at Clarkson. Um, and just re was really lucky just being around a really good coaching staff in college. And then, my first job with George, he's, he's obviously um, went to college with Coach Wilson and won a national championship at Bowling Green. But he, he's similar to Wilson, too, where he's a great first person to work for. He um, allowed me to, to do a lot of different things, allowed me to learn from my mistakes. I still talk to him a lot to this time. But um, definitely once, I would say, if a few months into coaching, definitely uh, got the itch for it and have enjoyed every single second of it. Jared, you, you started out in the D1 assistant coaching ranks at St. Lawrence a couple of years. Uh, Greg Carvel uh, hired you there, and then he got the job at UMass and brought you along as an assistant there. And you guys stepped into a, a program at UMass that was really in, in, in a bad place. And I remember talking to Coach Carvel about how he really had to inst instill kind of a a, a new look at things and character and so forth. Uh, and then last season, uh, the team played in the national championship game. What kind of things uh, did you do at UMass? What kind of a, a thing was it to, to turn around that program that had fallen from being at a pretty good level not too, uh, not too many years before that? Yeah. No, um, I mean, first and foremost, I think we had to change up our culture that we had in our locker room with the staff, with the community, with administration, with everybody and got them on board. Um, for me personally, like starting off at NAS with building a program, like I think that really helped as an experience with recruiting, with building networks. Um, the other assistant at, at UMass with uh, myself, Coach Ben Barr, he had experience at a couple other schools. So it was just really helpful where we knew we had to get not just good players, but, but good people, guys that knew, hey, to our first year, I think we won five games. Like we knew we had to have a mentality that um, you got a chip on your shoulder, blue collar. Um, Hockey East is obviously a, a pretty tough conference, um, but we just tried to work as hard as we could with, with finding good players, and good people, guys that 
wanted to continue to improve. And um, we were lucky too with the, the team that we inherited. Kel McCarr was already committed. There was a couple of good players um, and we added some good pieces to that. And we felt like going into last season, we thought we'd have, have a good team that we had some establishment, but it's still never really been done before. <laughs> Jared, one of the questions that came in from a, a listener is, uh, what's, what's the difference between playing in a Frozen Four and coaching in a Frozen Four? Um, I would, uh, I think I maybe had a little bit more uh, spare time on my hands as a coach, maybe a little bit more, uh, not quite as much stress, you know. I think as a coach, maybe I wasn't afraid to look around and soak it in a little bit. And as a player, like, was really laser focused on what you wanted to do and things like that. Um, same time, too, maybe as a coach, you sneak your head up to the jumbo trying and check that out a little bit as a player, like maybe just me being a goalie and maybe a little bit of a weirdo, not too much of a weirdo. Like I tried not to lose my focus and look at that stuff. Um, so, I mean, it was pretty cool both ways. I mean, uh, it was really cool last year in the frozen four, a bunch of RIT teammates texted uh, a few of them were at the game too. Um, so that definitely made it really, really special. Well, we want to make sure we get a couple of fan questions in, but we do also want to talk a little bit about the reunion. Now, I know, Chris, you had uh, playing obligations coming up. And a couple of guys were over in Europe who couldn't make it. But, uh, Jared, you were able to be back for the reunion, and we joked on Friday when we were testing out this that uh, last time we talked, RIT was down 4-1 to one to Canadian for our guest in the uh, second intermission of that. So kind of two parts of that. Uh, first, the overall uh, the overall weekend and, and being able to get back together with the guys, but but also the uh, kind of the atmosphere and the comeback uh, in a game that you guys, as members of that Frozen Four team, in a game in an arena that you guys really, in a way, helped build. Yeah, no, I mean it. That that weekend was awesome, and it's uh, it's probably the most I've laughed since college maybe, or say maybe some from one of our RIT bachelor parties or something like that. Um, we had, we had an unreal, unreal weekend kind of getting together and um, <clears throat> seeing the coaches and um, Lou Spiati and uh, President Deschler came back. So kind of getting everybody together. And um, once we get together, it's like we saw each other. It's like 10 years haven't passed. Like you don't miss a beat. Um, we're still, still telling a lot of the same jokes and laughing about the same things and things like that. Um, but it was definitely, it was definitely cool that third period. Um, I mean, I, I, we were maybe a little down in the dubs, but I remember us being up in the, in the Palestini center, in one of the box areas, we kept saying, Hey, like all we need is one goal here, one, one goal to get the boys going. And, uh, RIT got one and they got another and then the juices were flowing. We were going pretty crazy. Uh, definitely, uh, it was cool. I mean, for us, the funniest part was, uh, after RIT got the win, we all like went down to the ice and guys were running onto the ice. It was like the running of the bulls when the guys broke onto the ice and they're down by the corner crew and guys are waving and blowing kisses. And I'm like, Hey, like, let's act like we've been here before guys. Let's go. <laughs> Definitely a really, really fun weekend. My wife, um, she's an RIT graduate. We were, we were dating when I was at RIT. She's still, when I talked to the stories about the guys from that weekend, she's jealous. So maybe for the uh, 20 year anniversary, we got to find a way to get the, the wife and wife's kids involved. <laughs> it should be playing by then, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe a couple of questions that we haven't gotten to. Uh, there have been a bunch that have come in. Uh, for for each of you, uh, what have you taken away from your playing time at RIT and from that Frozen Four season that you've brought with you into your career? Um, I, I think for me it was um, – having fun and, and enjoying the moment. Um, I think you, a lot of times you get so caught up in everything else that's going on with, with hockey that you go, you go out there. And, and I think we just, honestly, we just went out there and played and, and have had fun and, and that we're loose and that's why we're, we were successful. So, I mean, it's having that little bit of confidence or, or, or a little bit of swagger that, that you can just go out there and, um, and compete is uh, is definitely something that I took from it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, for being a senior, like uh, it meant a lot for us. Where, as Wils mentioned, like kind of getting over that hump at of Blue Cross Arena um, to make the NCA tournament, things like that. It was 
that was obviously pretty gratifying. The year before we had a, we won the regular season championship and I think we still had a really, really good team. Um, and we would have really lost in overtime at blue cross, which stunk. Um, but then to be able senior year to finally get over the hump to win a few games, I think for a lot of us, it was a whatever. We're not as lucky as Tandy where we get to play in the NHL for us. That's some of the best hockey, best experiences we've ever had. And not just for us, but even for our families, I think a lot of us, um, my parents, all, all the guys, parents put a lot of time in driving your, your son to the rink. And, um, for me, I wasn't the most talented growing up. I was getting cut right, left, right, and center from a bunch of teams. And I know Tanny had to, to deal with some stuff when he was growing up for youth hockey. So I know for, for my parents, for my family, that was really, really gratifying. Just knowing whatever, putting all that time and effort and instilling that determination and, um, be able to make it to the frozen four. I mean, it's something that we get to talk about all the time. And, um, my parents not even being RIT graduates, they probably talked about RIT to me on a weekly basis. So it's something they never forget. So, so here's another question that uh, Wayne can uh, use in next year's recruiting video. What's your best advice for the next generation of hockey players at RIT or somebody who wants to come to RIT? Be the next Chris Tanev. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, um, I, I still say it today. Uh, the funnest playing in – at that arena at RIT is is that's the funnest I've I've ever had playing hockey. That the crowd, the atmosphere, um, it, it just gets you going. It's it's something that um, you really can't experience um, anywhere else. So, I mean, I've I've played in a lot of arenas now and in, in front of a lot of fans, but but during that time, it was I, I still think to this day it was the loudest, funnest arena that that I had uh, ever played in. There's a question that's uh, for uh, for both the uh, coaches. Uh, what is the best advice you have for a young coach looking to take steps in their career and looking to coach at a D1 level? Well, so we'll go age before beauty. So on you. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, you know, I got into it because I had a great experience when I played and, uh, right from the coaching staff, the fans and everything they've mentioned. And I've always wanted to make, I, I you know, I'm trying to, I, I went in as a phys ed teacher, so I'm still phys ed. I teach one subject, hockey, and that's it. But, you know, it's, you've got to put the players first. And I, I just really want every recruit that comes here, I want them to have success, but I want them to enjoy playing the game, their four years of college experience or one year, <laughs> but I just want them to enjoy it because it's it's a time that is is a special time. You're developing into young men, uh, and and why we were successful. I, I think we had good hockey players, and I might be un underselling that a little bit. But we had more special people, and all you have to do is really look at one, where they came from and their parents. Two, where they are now as husbands. A little pressure on you there. Uh, Tiny husbands and, and fathers, um, but what and their careers. So we're looking at two guys one still a very successful hockey player, another one a very successful coach. But we have success, uh, successful doctors, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, investors that whole group are all successful as people. And uh, the, the chemistry and your team will overcome talent every single time. Um, you know, long as relatively speaking, uh, but you know, special group, and that's why we won. And they're special to this day. You think you've got special team, but all you have to do is look at ten years later. Yeah, we are right on with these guys. Look, look what they've become as as uh, uh, community contributors, as 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 parents, as husbands. Uh, everything. It's all rolled into one, and you know, it's it's a special group, and. Uh, I've seen it before with my team, and it, 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 but that's the common bond. And and winning teams always go back and say, "Oh, uh, uh, you know, we had such a tight group." No teams win unless they're tight, and uh, the chemistry and the people are what makes championships. Well, we're just about out of time. Any uh, last uh, comments you want to pass along, guys, before we wrap up? No, uh, awesome to, to talk about the Frozen Four team and RIT. Good to good to see everybody's faces and Tanny to see his flow still is looking pretty nice. So, <laughs> no, very very appreciative to be here and uh, 
hopefully hockey gets back here soon, sooner rather than later and want to see Tandy back on the ice and hopefully have college hockey here coming back in the fall. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for having me on. Thanks for all the fans. Um, obviously, uh, Miss RIT and, and everyone around the program and the school. I mean, it's a, it's a very special place and, and somewhere that um, I'll definitely never forget. So, I mean, uh, I definitely appreciate every moment that I was there and, and thank you guys for listening. Yeah, thanks guys for, for having us. And, uh, you know, when uh, they asked, would you think Jared and Chris would be interested in coming on? It, it was a quick text or a quick phone call and, and they both jumped on it and that, says so much about them uh, wanting to kind of give back to RIT and really appreciate them coming on and uh, uh, for the fans and, and everyone else. I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, two great players, two great people. And uh, 10 years later, they, they haven't changed much. It's still fun to be around and, and thank everyone for listening. Well, if you have questions that we didn't get to, you can email them to ritalum at rit.edu and uh, they'll direct the questions to our guests today. So thank you for joining us. Please visit rit.edu slash alumni slash tigers dash staying dash home for alumni resources and upcoming events. There are going to be a bunch of virtual events coming up in the coming weeks and the alumni association would like to include you in as many as possible. One I'd really like to mention coming up this Thursday, the guest is going to be RIT men's lacrosse coach Jake Kuhn, who in 10 seasons at RIT has led the Tigers to a tremendous 188 and 23 record, 10 straight conference titles, 10 straight trips to the NCAA Division III tournament, and the Tigers only two appearances in national championship games. And Coach Kuhn will be discussing what the future holds for RIT men's lacrosse. So uh, thanks again. Please exit the webinar by simply closing your live storm window. And please let us know what you thought of the webinar through a brief survey that you're going to get by email. Have a great, great week and stay healthy and thanks for joining us today.